All right then, guys. Diving straight into it. As Snaggleguts' command echoes like a death knell through the camp, the goblins and ogres around you surge forward in a menacing tide, their faces twisted in fervor, ready to enact their chieftain's will. You find yourselves encircled, the eyes of the horde upon you, gleaming with anticipation and malice. The crackling fires cast long shadows, making the advancing figures seem larger more imposing. In this moment, the chaotic din of the camp morphs into a singular thunderous rush of movement, and it is aimed directly at you. Weapons are drawn and teeth are bared. The goblin horde closes in. So, what would you like to do? Well, what the fuck can we do, man? Well, I'm not going down without a fight. You guys want me? Come and fucking get me. Don't do it, Rar. The second we start killing them, we're going to throw away any sense of control we still have. We will have proved that we're no better or even worse than Snagglegut. Control? We don't have any control here, Tronald. It's gone. Come on, guys. You've got to tell me what you're doing. They're closing in fast. What are we doing, Tronald? We're standing down. Joe, we let ourselves be captured and dragged before Snagglegut. Almost instantly, rough hands seize you. The goblin horde, emboldened by your surrender, doesn't hesitate to exert their authority in the most brutal manner possible. You feel fingers coarse and unyielding wrap around your limbs and hair, yanking you with force that leaves no room for resistance. The ground beneath you becomes an unforgiving companion as you're dragged over rocks and through mud. The very earth seems to claw at you, snagging at your clothes and scraping against your skin. Finally, you're brought before Snagglegut, the massive goblin chieftain whose presence dominates the clearing. You're lined up, your arms wrenched painfully behind your backs by the sturdy grip of Snaggleguts enforcers. Saxi, Tronald, Rar, Alexandru, and Might, you all stand in a row, a motley crew of defiance in the face of overwhelming odds. Nearby, Grizzletooth remains grounded, still lying face down on the ground. Galba is also dragged beside you all. The camp around you falls into silence, the air thick with the tension of a thousand held breaths. Snaggleguts gaze sweeps over you, a slow, deliberate inspection that feels like the caress of a blade. Did you honestly believe you could infiltrate my ranks, sow seeds of dissent among my warriors, and orchestrate a coup within the very heart of my domain? Did you really think you could turn my troops against me? I, who have led them through battles and bloodshed, who have secured their loyalty with the spoils of our conquests. He paces before you, a predator circling its prey. You dared to challenge my authority, to undermine the order I have established, and for what? He steps forward towards you, Saxy, as he begins to lean in incredibly close, the stench of blood and iron pungent on his breath. Let me tell you about loyalty. It is earned through power and through fear. Loyalty is knowing the price of betrayal. You have made your play, and you have lost. But know this. Betrayal against me, against the Horde, is a death sentence, and I am judge, jury, and executioner. That's where you're wrong, Snagglegut. You see, loyalty born out of fear is a fragile thing. It holds as long as the shadow of terror looms over those you claim to lead. But fear is a fickle master. It only works until the feared becomes fallible, until the shadow recedes, until the sun rises. Loyalty fostered by fear might compel a man to lay down his life for you. But there's another kind of loyalty, one that's far stronger. Loyalty that comes from love. As the echoes of Saxe's challenge to Snagglegut ripple through the air, you observe a subtle but unmistakable shift among the assembled goblins and ogres. The firm grip on their weapons loosens slightly as their gazes dart between their comrades, searching for a sign of consensus or dissent. Their previously unwavering support for Snagglegut now seems tinged with doubt, their faces etched with questions and contemplation. Whispers begin to spread, a low murmur of uncertainty that snakes through the crowd, drawing their attention first to Snagglegut, then to Grizzletooth as he makes an effort to rise, and finally to Goba, small in stature but resolute. For a fleeting moment, it seems as though the very foundation of Snagglegut's rule could be questioned, as if a single breath could tilt the balance towards change. But then, Snagglegut's voice smashes through the gathering uncertainty like a hammer through glass. Silence! He takes a deep breath as he looks around the camp, eyeing each and every goblin and ogre up as he snarls his teeth before returning his gaze back towards you, Saxy. Loyalty born of fear 
is all these lot will ever know. Respecting strength, revering power. This is the fabric of our horde. Every single one of these goblins, these ogres, would lay down their lives for me. Not out of love, but because of the fear that cements their fealty. This is our way. And it is the only way they will ever understand. <laughs> yeah. Loyalty born of fear will make them die for you. But loyalty born of love. Loyalty born from love will make them want to live for you. Holy shit, dude. That was nice. Give me a persuasion check with disadvantage, Saxy. Uh, that's a 12 total, Joe. What was your highest roll, buddy? My highest one was a natural 18, but my other one was meh. Okay, so I'm going to give Saxy my port in 17, Joe. Oh, nice. So what does that bring you to then, dude? That will bring me to an 18, Joe. Saxy, as your words take root, a clear divide splits the horde. On one side, your eyes catch the glint of steel and iron as, one by one, weapons begin to fall to the ground. The sound of swords, axes, and spears clattering against the earth resonates like the first drops of rain in a storm through the night. These goblins, marked by a newfound resolve, stand weaponless, their silent rebellion a contrast to the unwavering loyalty of their counterparts. The air crackles with the tension of a horde cleaved in twain, a visual representation of the internal struggle that grips each member. Some gaze upon their disarmed brethren with confusion, while others grip their weapons tighter. Fools! Are you just going to listen to the words of outsiders who have been among us for all of a few days? Have you forgotten the blood we've spilled together, the battles we've won? Will you throw away your loyalty, your heritage, upon the whims of those who know not our ways? Snagglegut throws his arms outward in a rage before he starts beating on his chest. To question your loyalty to me, to us, is to deny your very nature. We are the Horde, united by strength, by the respect we command through power. To side with these interlopers is to betray everything we stand for. Joe. I look to Gaba and mouth to him. This is your time, Gaba. He's painting us as outsiders. You must show them the leader you are, the leader you will be. Gaba acknowledges what you say, Tronald, and a fire ignites in his eyes. He shrugs at the goblin who's holding him, whose grip has already slackened amidst the unfolding drama. Listen up, lads and lasses of our mighty horde. I've been thinking, dreaming, really, about what we're all doing here. It's been all about surviving under the thumb of fear, hasn't it? But, but what if I told you there's another way? Yeah, I'm talking about a horde where we ain't just scared pawns. A place where we stick together, not because we're terrified of getting squashed, but because we genuinely have each other's backs. Think about it. A horde where every single one of us, be you goblin, ogre, or whatever else, has a say. Where we fight, not because we have to, but because we want to protect what's ours and each other. Where strength ain't about making others cower, but about lifting each other up. This dream I've got, it's not just for me, it's for all of us. This dream I cannot fulfill alone, but together we can ditch the old scare tactics and build something epic. A horde that stands out, not just for how tough we are, but for how tight we are. Snaggleguts' laughter booms, echoing throughout the clearing. Before he steps within touching distance of Gaba, he bends low, pressing his forehead against Gaba's. So you admit it then, right from the little weasel's mouth. Who in the blazes of hell would ever want to follow you, eh? You're weak, a spineless little runt. What kind of leader is too scared to face his opponent head on? What kind of leader skulks in the shadows, weaving plots and schemes, attempting to poison his way to power? That's no leader. That's a coward! Snagglegut grips Gaba's neck tightly as he pushes him downward, Gaba's knees almost buckling under the weight. You think you can change the horde with dreams and speeches? You think they want a leader who can't even stand up for himself? Leadership is strength power and fear it's making your enemies quake at the mere mention of your name not whispering sweet nothings about unity and love this horde doesn't need a dreamer it needs a warrior someone who knows what it takes to survive to dominate 
not some pathetic idealist too feeble to hold his own in a real fight. Gubba, his eyes blazing with a fire born of conviction, stands his ground before Snagglegut, making direct eye contact with him, as he says. We went all sneaky like, cause it meant not one more of us gobbos had to die for nothing. Yeah? Not even you, Snagglegut. It don't have to be about scrapping and fighting all the time. There's building, learning, and and fellowship. Ain't there more to this world than just hacking and slashing? Gobba's voice rises, filled with a passion that you didn't know the little guy could muster. Ever think maybe you didn't want to be hated and feared wherever you go? Ever wanted to do something that folks thought Gobbos couldn't do? He swings his arms up, pointing a finger directly towards you, Rar. Looky here, will ya? Rawr! Half orc he may be, but he's got the love and respect of his mates, and mine too. In the blink of an eye, he's what we could all be. As Grizzletooth manages to push himself onto his knees, offering Goba a supportive nod, Snagglegut, with a swift and brutal motion, stomps his head back into the dirt, underscoring his disdain with physical force. The crowd, already silent, begin to avert their gaze, not knowing where to look, as Snagglegut turns his menacing gaze towards you, Rar, striding up to you with heavy steps. He towers a good two heads over you, staring down with eyes full of contempt and challenge. So this one is your idol, eh, Goba? He's what you want us all to aspire to be. Some half-breed bastard whose mummy got manhandled by a father that would rather eat him that love him. Someone who'd rather chain daisies than stand and fight. Is that it? Oh no. Do you really think this, this weakling represents strength? Strength isn't about making friends with your enemies or singing round campfires. It's about power fear, and respect taken by force. Rawr, he pushes his hand off you in a dismissive shove as he pounds his chest with a fist. I am Snagglegut. I've led you to glory and victory through blood. This... He thrusts a finger towards you, Rawr, jabbing you in your chest. This is not what we are. We are goblins. We are ogres. We are the terror in the night. The nightmare of the weak. And I'll be damned before I let anyone especially some outsider, tell us otherwise. Joe, I lock eyes with Snagglegut as I say, I am no unloved bastard. My mother loved me and my father loved the both of us. Love doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong. It gives you, it gives you something to fight for. So don't mistake Gobba's allotted name for me as an indication that kindness and love cannot exist alongside strength because I love fighting. I relish in the killing of my enemies. It brings a smile to my face that nothing else quite does. The tang of the blood of those who have wronged me is just the sweetest taste. So, I wonder, Snagglegut, how will your blood taste when it's dripping from my sword? You talk about power, you talk about strength, yet here you are playing judge, jury, and executioner while we stand bound and unable to defend ourselves. Is that your idea of strength? hiding behind a horde of real fighters while those you accuse can't fight back? If you're as strong as you claim, prove it! Face me in a trial of blood. Let's see if your strength is more than just words. Let justice be decided in a trial by combat. Snagglegut's gaze sweeps across the gathered horde, his eyes narrowing as he reads the crowd's anticipation, their respect for the challenge laid before him. The air is thick with tension, the silence punctuated only by the crackling of the fires and the distant hoot of a night creature. To refuse such a challenge, especially now in the eyes of his followers, would be to admit weakness, something no goblin chieftain could afford. With a heavy grunt, Snagglegut steps back, his eyes locking onto yours with a ferocity that could ignite the very air between you. Very well. You wish for a trial by combat, half-breed? Then a trial by combat you shall have. Let it be known to all. This is the way of our people. Strength rules and the strongest shall lead. Prepare the arena. Tonight we witness the true metal of our would-be challenger. Will his love help him rise as a victor, or will his blood water the grounds of our camp? 
As the uproar from the horde engulfs the camp, a primal fervor takes hold. The cacophony of roars, cheers, and the relentless clash of weapons against shields creates a tumultuous symphony, each goblin and ogre voicing their anticipation for the impending bloodshed. Some cry out for the upheaval of the old order, others for the demise of the challenger, but most simply for the spectacle of combat. Snagglegut, his figure imposing and unyielding, strides with purpose toward the fighting pits. His pace is steady, each step a declaration of his readiness to quash the rebellion or die trying. With all of you being aware of the camp's layout, you calculate that there is around three minutes before your arrival at the arena. This brief respite will be your only chance to steel yourselves for what lies ahead. Damn, Rar. That was well said. The only problem now is that you've actually got to beat him. He talks a big game, but talks all it is. We've faced bigger and badder. Just need to make sure I hit harder than he does. Joe, this goes without saying that we're whispering to each other at this point. Do any of you spellcasters have anything that can help RAR out? Yeah, I've got something. And that's exactly what I plan to do. But I can't do it yet, else it will run out far too early. It's got to be right before the battle starts. Yeah, I'll give you a bardic inspiration, buddy. I'll see if I can sneak a few in whilst you're fighting as well. That's if I'm close enough and not being watched. How are you going to inspire him, Might? Oh, well, the triangle and poems are out of the window. There's no need for that fancy flourish as it'll just attract too much attention, probably. So I'm just gonna whisper to him, you've got this, my big green Batman. Oh, actually, Joe, on this walk over, I'm gonna put my hand on Rar's back for a minute, and I'm going to cast Gift of Alacrity on him. Ooh, okay, sweet. What does that do? It'll allow him to add 1d8 to his initiative rolls. Wow, that's actually huge, man. I don't know how strong this guy is, but he took that Ziggletoe out in one hit. So if Rar can make the first move, getting his rage popped off, then it's gotta boost his odds, surely. Oh, and I'm going to cast False Life on you, Rar, at level two. This will give you an additional 11 points of health. Thanks, guys. All right, then. As you, Rar, approach the fighting pit, you're met with a sight that sets your heart thundering like the drums of war. The pit is a yawning maw in the earth, bordered by towering spikes that seem to thirst for blood. Fires blaze at equidistant points around the circle, casting a hellish glow that dances across the weapon-scarred ground, and the twisted, eager faces of the crowd perched above like carrion birds waiting for a feast. You can almost taste the desire for violence on your tongue, heavy and acrid as the smoke that coils lazily upward into the dark sky. Snagglegut leaps into the pit with a bestial grace that belies his bulk, throwing his arms wide in a challenge to the heavens themselves. He bellows, a raw sound of defiance and power that ripples through the crowd, igniting a frenzy of cheers. The goblin chief moves with a swagger to one side of the pit. All right then, I guess this is it. I'll see you guys on the other side, or not. Who knows? Wait, Rar. I'm going to give you a little buff, but as soon as it's been cast, you need to engage him immediately. It won't last long. Okay, Joe. I'm going to cast haste on him. Okay, I'm going to need you to make a sleight of hand check, Tronald. Lucky. That's better. All right, so that's a 19 total, Joe. All right, sweet. So it doesn't look like anyone saw you do that. Okay. As soon as I feel the power of Tronald's spell rushing through me, I jump into the pit. Then I fucking rage before charging towards Snagglegut. Nice. I'm going to need you to roll initiative for me, Rar. Ugh, that's a 14 total. Don't forget about the buffs, dude. Oh yeah, I'm going to use both the bardic inspiration from Might and the buff from Tronald. Good idea. You need to make sure you're going first. Well, I'd be surprised if I wasn't after that. I rolled two eights, Joe. So that's a 30 total. Holy crap. Yeah, he rolled a 25, so you're definitely going first, buddy. Sweet. So I want to charge towards the bastard and take three swings towards him. Are you doing reckless great weapon master on these, dude? Nah, not yet. I have a plan. So that's a 19, a 20, and a 25 to hit, Joe. Yeah, all of them would hit, buddy, but he's going to use his parry ability on the 19, making that one miss. So it's just two that hit. Roll your damage. So, that's 31 points of damage total, Joe. Rawr, with a warrior's gleam in your eye, you charge towards Snagglegut. Your great sword is a deadly pendulum, arcing through the air as you strike. The first blow is parried by Snagglegut's axe as he displays his quick reflexes, but your momentum is relentless, and your next attacks are a storm. They barrel through his defenses, your sword biting deeper and deeper into Snagglegut with every slash. How'd you like that, eh? Snaggle guy? Snagglegut, grinning through the pain, lets out a low chuckle. Pretty quick for a half-breed, aren't you? But speed isn't everything. Now it's his turn. Snagglegut rages, 
And as he does, it seems to manifest as a storm where electricity begins crackling and coursing over his hulking form. He bellows a war cry and his axe becomes a conduit for his fury. He swings at you, Rar, with an unrelenting force. That's a 19 and a 22 to hit. The attacks slice through the air, each finding their mark. The axe tears into you with a combined 28 slashing damage, the electric energy searing flesh for an additional seven. Snagglegut's eyes blaze with hatred as he invokes the fury of the small, which is kind of weird given his large frame. But anyway, that brings it to 43 damage, then adding his rage to them, that's four more. The total onslaught racks up to a brutal 47 points of damage, the arena resonating with the sound of his vicious assault. Well, all of that's halved because of my rage. Indeed it is, buddy. So that's reduced to 23 damage. Hey, guys, he can't go on with this frontal assault. Going head-to-head -head with him with no strategy involved is going to leave him in a bad spot. I'm pretty sure he knows that, Saxy. Don't underestimate him. When it comes to fighting, he's always thinking of things that surprise me. It's his craft and he's brilliant at it. Joe, I'm going to shout out, come on, Ra, you've got this, my man, and I'm going to give him a bardic inspiration. All right, Joe, I'm gonna to say to him, well, it might not all be about speed, but I've spent long enough around Saxy to know that force equals mass times acceleration. He gives you a confused look and says, what does that even mean? It means you're fucked. All right, Joe, I'm going to make two attacks towards Snagglegut. That's a 13 and a natural fucking 20 baby. Nice. So the 13 misses, but obviously the natural 20 hits. So that's 24 total damage reduced to 12 because of his rage. Then I'm going to use my hasted action to try to push him as hard as I can to the floor. Oh, okay, sweet. So give me an athletics check, Rar. He's going to make one too. I'm pretty sure you'll have advantage on this because he has it through his rage. So he rolled a 22 on his check. Damn, so I only rolled a 19, but I'm going to add Might's Bardic Inspiration to this. Yeah, that's better. That's a 24 total. You focus, Rar, feeling the hot sting of battle coursing through your veins. With a guttural yell that mirrors the ferocity of the Snagglegut storm, you charge, lowering your shoulder as you aim for his formidable torso. Your hands, engines of war driven by fury and might, slam into his chest. The sound of the impact reverberates, a testament to the clash of titans. Snagglegut's eyes widen in shock. His feet lose their purchase on the gritty floor, and down he goes, the ground shuddering upon his fall. Lying there in the dirt, Snagglegut's face twists into a snarl of pure, undiluted rage. His voice, a growl of fury and pride wounded, echoes around the pit. You think this is your moment, boy? I've risen from worse, and by the end you'll be nothing but a stain beneath my boot. You've awakened the storm, boy, and you will be swept away. You've got to stop calling me boy, because it's going to be pretty fucking embarrassing when you lose if you've referred to me as such. Suppose it wouldn't matter too much though, cause, you know, you'll be dead. All right, Joe, I'm gonna run as far as I can using my movement of 80 feet to the opposite end of the arena. Rawr, as you bolt, Snagglegut's instincts kick in. He lashes out with a reckless swing intended to halt your retreat. So that's a 14 to hit. Nah, no chance. His blade whistles through the air where you stood just a heartbeat ago, but your swift feet carry you beyond its reach. The blade meets nothing but the empty space. Ha, huh, you missed. As the dust settles from your hasty retreat, Snagglegut scrambles to his feet, rage etched across his snarling face. With a primal roar, he rises and charges forward, though his movement is hampered by the surprise of your earlier shove. He closes some of the distance between you, his furious gaze locked onto yours. But but as he comes to a stop, still too far to strike, his anger boils over. Coward! He bellows across the arena, his shout a mix of frustration and begrudging respect for your tactics. The crowd's reaction is a cacophony of cheers and jeers, their bloodthirst undiminished by the momentary lull in combat. All right, buddy, we're back to you. All righty, doodly. I'm going to pick up a stone. Then I'm going to close my eyes before throwing the stone towards Snagglegut. This will be with my hasted action. Um, are you sure, dude? You'll be giving yourself disadvantage on the attack by closing your eyes. Well, it will be a straight roll because Snaggle just used a reckless attack, but yeah, I'm sure. That makes no sense, dude. Just throw something heavier and with your eyes open. Saxy, let him cook. All right then, man, if you're sure. Roll an attack roll for me. 
Yes, that's a natural two. Hey, why is he getting excited over the fact that he's going to miss? He's probably got some big brain move going on. Then, with my actual action, I'm going to gather as much of these barricades as I can before I start throwing them into the fire. Basically, I want to make it bigger. Yeah, sure you can do that. Then I'm going to move over here, Joe. You know, so the fire doesn't eat me. Rar, you set to work with determined grunts, grabbing the wooden barricades with both hands. The splintering cracks of timber fill the air as you tear them from their moorings. Each piece you hurl into the flames sends sparks spiraling up into the night. The once modest fire begins to roar with newfound ferocity, casting a wild dance of shadows across the pit walls. Snagglegut watches, perplexity twisting his brutish features. After a moment, he sneers and calls out, his voice laced with mockery. Look at this, lads! Seems our fearsome challenger prefers to play with fire! Then face a real fight! Are you building yourself a nice cozy bonfire to warm up your cold feet? Oh, don't worry about it. How about you just focus on catching up to me, you hefty, slow fucker? He's going to move 30 feet towards you, Rar. Then, once he realizes there's no way he's going to be able to reach you, he's going to use his action to do the dodge action. So it's your turn again, buddy. Well, if you're just gonna stand there gawping, putting up your defenses with your ickle dodge techniques, don't mind me if I just gather more wood to make this fire bigger. Joe, I'm just going to get more wood for my fire with my action. Then, with my hasted action, I'm going to pick up a small rock or a loose piece of wood, close my eyes again, and throw it at his noggin. You're confusing me, dude. Go on then, roll an attack with disadvantage. Nice. That's a 13 to hit, Joe. That misses. Good. You're losing me, man. Are you just fucking around, or do you actually have a plan? It's from Sun Tzu's Art of War. How can the enemy know what you're about to do next if you yourself don't? I don't think that's an accurate phrasing, Alexandra. It doesn't matter if we know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. That's what matters. So, as I said before, let him cook. All right, then. So it's Snaggleguts' turn. So his rage has faded at this point. As Snagglegut realizes his rage has subsided, a momentary flicker of vulnerability crosses his monstrous visage, quickly replaced by a renewed fury. With a deep, bellowing growl, he invokes his rage once more, electricity crackling around him like a tempest reborn. Then, with a ground-shaking roar, he charges across the arena toward you, using every ounce of his considerable strength to dash as the ground trembles with each step. However, once he realizes he cannot make up enough distance to reach you, his voice thunders across the fighting pit, filled with unchecked rage. You think you can toy with me, Ra? You think you can make a fool of Snagglegut in front of his horde? I'll crush you! I'll show them all what happens to those who dare stand against me! Spittle flies from his mouth as he shouts, the very air seeming to vibrate with his anger. My god, can you stop spitting everywhere please, Snaggle Lump? You're going to put out my fire at this rate. You seem to be making him incredibly furious, Ra. That pleases me. Anyway, it's your turn now, buddy. I want to use my hasted action to shove him. Not onto the floor this time, just five feet away. This is quickly turning into one of our Baldur's Gate 3 sessions with all this shoving. So he rolled a 19. Unlucky for him then, because I rolled a 22. Rar, in a moment of sheer power, you shove him, your hands finding his chest and pushing with all your might. Snagglegut stumbles backwards, his eyes wide with shock and anger at the unexpected resistance. Snagglegut roars, his voice thundering across the arena, each syllable dripping with venom. How dare you continue to mock me! I'll flay you for this, Ra! You filthy half-breed bastard! All right, Joe. I'm going to use my normal action to collect more wood from over here and run on over back to my fire, building it up. Then, I'm going to shout out towards Snagglegut. I'm just going to throw a suggestion out for you, Snagglechunk, because it seems like I've got all the time in the world to kill whilst you catch up to me. Why don't you shut your fucking mouth with your whiny little bitch mentality and actually do something about it? Because I'm making a goddamn fool out of you, and all these fine goblins and ogres are here to bear witness to how easy the great Snagglegut can be pushed around. As Snagglegut's fury reaches a boiling point, the very air around him seems to crackle with his wrath. He loses his rage once more, unable to land a blow or suffer one in return, his frustration mounting to new heights. Yet, undeterred, he summons the depths of his anger once again, igniting another rage that envelops him in a visible aura of electric vengeance. With a bellow that resonates through the arena, he charges at you, Rar, using every ounce of his strength to close the distance between you. Yet, 
once again, he arrives beside you with no action to attack you with. He's literally just running circles around him. Yep, I told you he had something ingenious planned. Yeah, I see it now, and it's actually working. I still don't get it, guys. Can you explain to me what the hell's going on? He's meticulously depleting Snagglegut's reserves, enraging him to the point of blindness. Snagglegut's so consumed by fury, he's oblivious to the strategy unfolding against him. It's a masterful game Rar's playing, and he's closing in on the checkmate. I'm a shout out to Rar. Kick his ass giving him another bardic inspiration. Well, it's your turn again, Rar. Well, I'm pretty sure that Tronald's haste has around 20 seconds left on it, so I need to begin wrapping this up. How's my fire looking, Joe? Your fire's looking great, man. Like, the best fire ever. Beautiful. Well, I suppose I don't need to add any more fuel to it now. Seems like it's good enough for the purpose it will serve. All right, Joe, I'm going to try to shove him five feet away again. Roll it for me, man. So that's a 15 for me. Finally. He rolled a natural 20, buddy. No, he didn't. He rolled an eight. Seriously, man, are you doing what I think you're doing? You're damn right I am. I'm giving Snagglegut my portent eight. Wow. All right, then. So he gets pushed back another five feet. Excellent. All righty. I'm going to run all the way up here, Joe. Then shout out, come and get me, Slowpoke. So what are you doing for your action, dude? Um, I don't really need to do anything for my action. Maybe I'll moon him. Yeah, that's a good idea. Joe, I moon Snagglegut. Take a good look at this, you big brainless mass. Wow. Well, that really wasn't something I wanted to see. You should count yourself lucky, Alexandru. People would pay a lot of coin to see this back home. Hmm, I'm not sure that's correct. So it's his turn again. And well, this is the thing. Because he, yet again, didn't manage to make an attack against you or take damage, his rage fades once more. And this time, he seems unable to produce the same anger that he did before. It seems as though he's out of rage slots. Nevertheless, he's still just as furious, so he uses his action to dash towards you, Rar. Silence! Just shut up and fight me! It's your turn, Rar. It's time to wrap this up. Joe, I make three attacks towards him. You! That's a 15, an 18, and a 22. Rar, as you unleash a flurry of swings with your greatsword, the first slice cuts through the air, missing Snagglegut, who nimbly ducks under. Unfazed, you attempt a second attack, only to have Snagglegut skillfully parry, his axe meeting your blade with a loud clash. But your perseverance pays off. Seeing an opening as he parries, you push his axe aside and thrust forward decisively. The sharp tip of your sword pierces through Snagglegut's guard, sinking into him as the crowd gathers gasps at the impact. So that's 16 points of damage to him, Joe. No longer halved because he ain't raging no more. Awesome, man. Rar, it's at this point you feel a sudden surge within your sword. The weapon's sigils ignite in a brilliant display of necrotic energy as it weaves around the blade. All right, now it's his turn. As Snagglegut recoils from your strike, the fury in his eyes intensifies. With a growl, he launches two swift attacks. The first, a 23 to hit, carves a painful path across the back of your calf, yanking you forward off balance. Before you can recover, the second attack, a critical hit, lands under your chin with devastating force, sending your head snapping back, stars exploding in your vision. Because he rolled a natural 20, he gets to immediately make another attack. So, capitalizing on your momentary disorientation, Snagglegut unleashes a third assault. That's a 25 to hit. Bringing his axe down hard on top of your skull, the impact reverberates through your head, a sharp pain suggesting you might have lost a tooth in the process. As the crowd roars, Snagglegut channels his Fury of the Small, intensifying the assault. The total damage comes to a staggering 50, half to 25 due to your raging resilience, but the hit leaves you reeling, a metallic taste filling your mouth. Is that all you've got? I eat them kind of attacks for breakfast. Snagglegut's response is a derisive laugh tinged with malice. You've had one, yes, but what about second breakfast? With a sudden burst of ferocity, he taps into his reserves, muscles bulging as he prepares to unleash another barrage of attacks with his action surge, his eyes gleaming with the promise of more pain. Uh. His first swing, a 24 to hit, is a masterful stroke that carves across your chest, the sharp edge of his ax, finding a gap in your defenses. The hit lands with a thud, drawing a line of fire across your skin. The second is a natural 20, another critical hit. The world seems to slow as you see the axe descend in a perfect arc, striking you squarely on the shoulder. The force of the blow is so intense you can feel it reverberate through your bones. Because he rolled a nat 20, he once again gets to make an extra attack. That's a tainted 20. The blade meets flesh once again, driving you to your knees. So that's a total of 38 points of damage, halved to 19 because of your rage. How are you feeling, Rar? Oh, I'm absolutely swell. So it's your turn now, buddy. What you doing? Okay. 
I want to move over here, Joe. Then I'm going to use my hasted action to jump into the air and attempt to wrap my legs around Snagglegut's neck, grappling him. So that's a 22 on my athletics. Nice. Well, he rolled an 18 total, so he's now classed as grappled by you. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to grip both edges of my cloak of the bat, then fly diagonally into the air, 40 feet up, 40 feet across, right over here. Then I'm going to release my grip on him, dropping him into the nice little bonfire I've created. I'm Batman! That's awesome, dude. All right, so that's 17 points of bludgeoning damage from his fall and seven points of fire damage from landing in the flames. Well, that was graceful as fuck. Well, he's nothing if not graceful. All righty. Now, I'm going to release the edges of my cloak, sending me plummeting down on him, falling Minotaur style. So I'm going to make two attacks on him, both reckless, both great weapon master. So that's a 20 and a 21 total. Nice. So roll your damage for me, man. Can you do the fall damage first? Yeah, sure, buddy. So that's 15 points of bludgeoning damage shared between you both. So seven for him and seven for you, reduced to three for yourself. Then you also take five points of fire damage, reduced to two. Okay. So that's 26 points of damage for my first attack. Then that's 22 points of damage for my second attack for 48 total. Then I'm going to pump my 5d10 necrotic damage from my sword into the second attack. So that's another 26 points of necrotic damage. So all in all, that's 74 points of damage for this round. 104 if we're including all the fancy extras. Rawr, towering over Snagglegut as you deliver your relentless onslaught. He gasps for breath, managing only a feeble few words. Who, who even are you? Rawr, how do you want to do this? I am the green god. I am the wielder of Nepthet Kar the harbringer of Anubis's will. I am the bear elk Batman. I am the bringer of death and the collector of souls. I am also quite the connoisseur of food. You see, I already won this fight before it began, so I thought I'd get the fire going, ready to cook you. I truly hope you taste better than you fight. Then I take a final slash at his neck, taking his head clean off as I grip it in my hands and raise it to the crowd. Are you not entertained? Rar, as you descend from the sky, a verdant tempest personified, the arena below becomes a blur. Your fall towards Snagglegut is a spectacle of might and fury, kind of like the assault of Levi on the beast Titan. Each strike of your blade is precise, a dance of death orchestrated by the whispering will of Nephthet Ka. The crowd watches breathless as your final devastating slash severs Snagglegut's head from his shoulders. Time seems to freeze as you grasp the trophy of your victory, lifting it high for all to see. The arena, initially wrapped in a stunned silence, suddenly erupts. A volcanic release of roars and cheers cascades around you, the horde's voices united in awe and frenzied excitement. Your declaration thunders over them, not a question but a statement of the undeniable prowess you've just bestowed upon them. I jump into the arena, Joe, and immediately cast Cure Wounds at level 2 on Rar, sprucing him up a bit. That's 15 points of healing. I also want to go into the center of the arena, Joe, but I'm going to do it with flair. I cast Vortex Warp on myself, appearing directly beside Rar, gripping him tightly as I raise his hand into the sky. I'm doing this because the haste has probably just worn off, and I don't want him to display any essence of fatigue. Thanks, best buddies. Then I shout out to the Horde, Snagglegut's reign of terror is at an end. Hear me, for we stand before you not as tyrants, but as harbingers of a new era. An era where each of you, every goblin, every ogre, will wield a voice as mighty as any blade. Your dreams, your aspirations, they no longer flutter aimlessly in the wind. They are your birthright, attainable through the steel of your resolve and the sweat of your brow. Goba, our chosen leader, will shepherd this new beginning, ensuring that each and every one of you is cherished. Your needs met with the diligence of a watchful guardian while we, your silent sentinels, will guard you from the veils of obscurity. The time for mere existence is past. Now, you shall truly live, thrive, and etch your names in the annals of history. If you stand with us, if you embrace this covenant of prosperity and unity, let your voices rise. Let the very foundations of this realm tremble with your acceptance. Let me hear it. 
The arena, once a cauldron of violence and bloodlust, now surges with an overwhelming tide of unity and joy. Goblins and ogres, moved by your words, leap into the arena, their arms reaching out not in aggression but in celebration. They lift you and your companions high, tossing you into the air as if you weigh no more than feathers, a physical manifestation of their acceptance and their readiness to embrace this new dawn. Oh, for fuck's sake, not this again. Embrace it, Saxy. We know you love it. But amidst the cacophony of cheers and the symphony of newfound hope, a singular sound cuts through the jubilation, a slow, ominous clap. Its rhythm is deliberate, each clap a cold, stark contrast to the warmth of the moment. As you turn towards the source, a path clears amidst the throng of creatures, their expressions morphing from elation to confusion. Walking through the corridor formed by the divided crowd is a figure you're very familiar with. It is Elder Rattlebone the real Elder Rattlebone. Seriously, this can't be fucking happening. Elder Rattlebone steps forward, her presence like a cold shadow stretching across the arena. Her voice, silky yet laced with venom, carries effortlessly to every ear. Oh my, oh my. I suppose congratulations are in order. You've managed to dethrone poor old Snagglegut, but how? By masquerading as me, by exploiting my authority to rally the troops to your cause. At this moment, with a flick of her wrist, a surge of magic ripples through the air, dispelling the illusion that had shrouded might. The crowd, stunned into silence, gasps and grunts in disbelief. You are but tricksters, vile and repugnant charlatans. Is this the leadership you offer? Deception and falsehood? Is this the foundation upon which you wish to build your new era? And now you propose to replace Snagglegut with... with what? More lies, more shadows. No, this will not stand. I will not allow it. I will assume Snagglegut's mantle, and under my rule, we will not suffer fools or frauds. So hear me now, my horde. Kill them. Kill these deceitful interlopers. Let their blood serve as testament to our strength and our unity. Let it be known that we, the horde, will not be swayed by lies or treachery. We stand together, bound by strength, honor, and the unwavering leadership that I shall provide. As her speech crescendos, the arena, once a space of jubilant victory, becomes a chamber of tension and impending doom. The crowd, momentarily seized by the gravity of her words, stands at the brink of decision. Well, fuck. Joe, I step forward, ready to speak to the crowd. Might, as you step forward, ready to address the tumultuous crowd, a firm hand abruptly grasps your shoulder. You whirl around, half expecting confrontation, only to find Grizzletooth, the ogre's face contorted with fury. However, it is not a fury directed at you, Might, but aimed beyond you. Without a word, Grizzletooth positions you behind him, stepping in front of you as his gaze locks onto Rattlebone with an intensity that could burn through steel. How about now? How about you fuck off out of this camp, Rattlebone? Do you really think we didn't know that this fella wasn't you? I saw through the guys. But you know what? I didn't give a rat's ass. It was the perfect ruse to overthrow the corrupt throne you and Snaggle got warmed with your asses. We followed them because we believed in them. And bugger me, I still do. Now more than ever. His gaze sweeps across the gathered horde, a challenge in his eyes. So I put it to you, my fellow goblins and ogres. If these outlanders, these friends were willing to risk their necks for our freedom, what kind of shits would we be to turn on them now? Are we so eager to toss away this shot at real freedom, only to shackle ourselves again under another tyrant's heel? As the words of Grizzletooth's impassioned speech fade into the crackling of the campfires, a profound shift sweeps through the gathered horde. The goblins and ogres, moments before a divided mass of uncertainty, turn as one entity towards Rattlebone. Weapons that had been uncertainly held now point decisively in her direction, the metallic glint of their intent unmistakable in the firelight. Then an ogre, massive and imposing, steps forward, his hand large enough to encompass Rattlebone's entire shoulder clasps down with a gentle yet unyielding firmness. We stand with Grizzletooth, we stand with Goba, we stand with our new friends. 
His voice, a rumbling declaration of unity, echoes the newfound resolve of the Horde. Rattlebone's reaction is instantaneous. Her eyes, wide with disbelief and the dawning realization of her isolation, flash with fury as she sharply slaps away the ogre's hand. Her gaze sweeps across the assembled masses, a venomous glare promising retribution. But it's when her eyes find Tronald that they narrow into a pointed, malevolent stare. In the next heartbeat, she vanishes. A mere whisper of her presence remains, dispersing like smoke into the night air. That was incredible, Grizzletooth. Did you, did you really mean what you said about knowing? Of course I did, mate. But I figured you were trying to keep that under wraps for our sake, for our future. So that worked for me. I walk up to Grizzletooth and give him a cure wounds as well. All right, guys, it's been a pretty hectic day. What do you all say about getting some rest? Oh, I'm absolutely down for that. Yeah, it's been stressful as hell but I'm looking forward to heading back to the monastery and letting Master Shenzu know that everything is going to be okay. Well, let's get some rest then. And first thing in the morning, we can make our way back to let them know. Wait, guys, we're not finished yet. We still need to decide what to do with the traitors to our cause. Glink, Poxface, and Mudmaw. I'm assuming it was them two who betrayed us, you know, because they didn't get dragged up to Snagglegut like the rest of us. Ah, shit. Yeah. Well, Gaba, you're the commander in chief. So what do you want to do about it? Gaba scratches his head, the weight of leadership visibly settling on his small shoulders. He glances around at the expectant faces of his new comrades. Right, right. OK, let me just. Right. So grizzle tooth, big guy. You've always been one to keep things in line around here. And you're my right hand ogre after all. How about you and the lad start rounding up them traitors? Then once you've got them, bring them here to me. We're going to have ourselves a a gathering like a trial kind of thing. We'll listen to what they've got to say for themselves. It ain't going to be like old Snagglegut's ways. No, sir. We'll do this fair and square. We're starting fresh, ain't we? You've got it, boss gobber. Come on, lads. Let's find them and bring them here. With a gesture. Grizzletooth leads the charge, a veritable army of 50 goblins and six ogres falling into step behind him. Their departure from the center of the camp is a sight to behold, a blend of determination and chaotic enthusiasm as they split into groups, each tasked with scouring different sections of the camp and the surrounding area. Around 30 minutes pass before Grizzletooth strides back into the clearing, a triumphant grin plastered across his face, followed by his motley crew of goblins and ogres. Without any unnecessary delay, two disheveled goblins are unceremoniously tossed at the feet of Gaba and the group, landing in a tangled heap of limbs and muffled curses. All right, so here's the tale of the night, mates. We managed to sniff out these two sneaky buggers. They were hiding out in the last place you'd think to look, the latrines. I kid you not, they were nestled in there tighter than a goblin in a gnome's hat. One of them was even clutching a bar of soap like it was some sort of defense mechanism. So, how did we coax them out, you ask? Well, we didn't want to dive in after them, not with the stench wafting out of there. No, we were cleverer than that. We told them that the new boss has ordered that the latrines be scheduled for an immediate deep clean with boiling water. You should have seen them. They came bolting out of there faster than a war on fire, squealing about keeping their precious hides intact. So yeah, they're a little stinky, but they're here. What about Glink? He's not with you. Didn't you manage to find him? Uh, yeah, yeah. We scoured every nook and cranny, but that slippery sod is nowhere to be seen. My guess, he's legged it out of camp. All right then, Gubba, they're here. It's time to do the trial. Gubba scratching his head in a manner that seems both thoughtful and a tad overwhelmed by his newfound authority, glances over towards Saxie and Tronald. So, um, this whole trial thingy, I was thinking, Maybe one of yous, like Saxy or Tronald, could do the question asking. You know, get to the bottom of this whole mess. I mean, I just got this big hat of command, and it's still sitting a bit loose, if you get me. Plus, you lot have a way with words that makes mine sound like a frog croaking. Yeah, of course we can, Gaba. You've never done anything like this before, so understandably, you'd want to take a back seat for the first time. Remember, a great leader isn't afraid to ask for help or advice with things he isn't too familiar with. All right, let's get to the bottom of this. First off, why? Why did you betray our trust, your potential for a better future? The first goblin, Poxface, a wiry creature with a nervous twitch, blurts out, We we didn't see a future here. Snagglegut, he's, he was strong, feared, thought aligning with him was our best shot, didn't reckon on all this. 
He gestures around, indicating the shift in power and the assembly of goblins and ogres eyeing them with a mix of curiosity and disdain. And what of now? Seeing what we, alongside Goba and Grizzletooth, aim to build, a community where every goblin has a voice, a chance. Would you not prefer that to living under the thumb of fear? The second goblin, Mudmaw, larger and with a scar bisecting his cheek, grunts before speaking. Aye, sounds nice, that does. But we made our bed, didn't we? Thought you'd just kill us, like. Didn't think there'd be talking. All right. If given the chance, knowing full well the penalty for further betrayal would be death, and you would have a lot of trust to rebuild if you were to stay, would you not want to be a part of this new vision? or would you rather take your chances outside the camp safety? The wiry goblin's eyes dart between Saxi and Tronald, then to Gaba and the expectant crowd before sighing. Always thought the grass wouldn't be greener on the other side, I did. But look where that got me. Given the chance, I'd, we'd stay. But that's your call, ain't it? Okay. Gaba, I think that's all the questions we need to ask. It's time for you to make your decision. Gaba steps forward clearing his throat as he prepares to address not just the two goblins before him, but the entirety of the camp gathered around. His voice, surprisingly firm and authoritative, cuts through the murmurs of the crowd. All right, here's the deal. I've heard what you've said, and I've seen the choices you've made. It ain't easy deciding the fate of others, especially when betrayal stings deep. But here, in this new era we're ushering in, we're about second chances about proving that we're better than the old ways. Better than Snagglegut, better than fear. You two will stay, but don't think it's going to be easy. You'll have to re-earn the trust you so carelessly threw away. From this moment, your ranks are stripped, your possessions forfeited. For the next three months, you're on probation. If you can stay clear of trouble, show us you're truly with us. You'll get your stuff back, plus a fair share of the camp's earnings during your time of service. But let's be clear, these three months won't be a holiday. You'll work for the camp, maintain it, ensure it thrives. Show us, show me that you're worth this second chance. Prove that you believe in what we're building here. Do that and you'll find a place among us once again. Fail and you'll find the gates of this camp closed to you forever. That's a fair punishment, Gaba. Well done. All right, I'm off to explore Snagglegut's stronghold before heading off to bed. You want to come with us, Gaba Grizzle? Now, nah, mate. I might be all bashed up, but the night's still young. We've got a whole camp to celebrate with, plenty of grog to go around, and, oh, can't forget, frog tossing. Wouldn't be a real celebration without a bit of that, now would it? Go on, explore what you want to explore. I'll be here living it up the only way we know how. Grog in one hand and a frog in the other. Yeah, I reckon I'll stick around here too. There's a lot to take in, and honestly, I want to soak it all up. This, this is a night of firsts for many of us, I. First night of our new lives, free from the shadows of Snagglegut and fear. Let's make it one for the history books. Plus, I've got to make sure no one gets too out of hand with the celebrations. Someone's got to be the responsible one. And it looks like that someone's me. For now, anyway. Enjoy the stronghold, you lot. We'll be here, making sure the camp's still standing. Come morning. All right. Well, don't have too much fun without us. Okay then, Joe. We head up to the stronghold. Before we do, I just want to go back to the pit where Snagglegut's body is. I walk up to his charred remains and search his body for any sort of key. I'm guessing he will have a few goodies locked away up there, along with doors we probably won't want to smash down, so probably best we find a way of opening them. That's a good idea, man. Give me an investigation check, Rar. That's a 15. As you approach the remnants of Snagglegut, the air still tinged with the scent of charred flesh and metal, you find yourself almost hesitant. The once fearsome leader of the goblin horde is now nothing more than a heap of blackened flesh. Among the debris, something catches your eye, a small metallic glint. Crouching down, you brush aside some of the char, revealing a singular key lying amidst the ruins. Key now in hand, you head towards the stronghold, the very heart of Snagglegut's domain. 
The hanging cages sway gently in the night breeze. This part of the camp is deserted, the celebrations and chaos of the horde's newfound freedom happening far from here. It gives you a moment of peace, a chance to reflect on the battles fought and the lives changed this night. Okay, I want to try to open the main doors. As you push open the massive double doors, they give way with a groan, revealing the grand interior of the fort, a structure long abandoned by humans now reclaimed by the goblin horde. The torchlight flickers, casting shadows across the aged stone walls, where dust and time have settled into every crevice. The hallway before you is lined with statues of human warriors, their stances noble, their faces set in expressions of valor and determination. These silent sentinels of a bygone era, carved from chipped marble, stand guard over a fort they could no longer protect, their polished surfaces reflecting the dim light. Beyond the corridor diverges, leading to various chambers that once buzzed with the life of its human inhabitants. Now these rooms stand empty, their grandeur a memory faded by time. Tapestries, once vibrant, depicting battles and heraldic achievements, hang limply from the walls. Their colors are dulled, the threads thinning. Well, shall we have a look around to try figure out where Snagglegut keeps his stash? Yeah, sure. But... I'm actually incredibly interested in these statues. They seem incredibly grand for just a random fort. Well, if you're interested in them, why don't you investigate it a bit? We're in no rush. Okay, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, I'm gonna investigate these statues further, Joe. Is there anything about them that I recognize or am familiar with? Give me a history check, Saxy. That's a 23 total, Joe. Saxy, with your curiosity piqued by the statue's grandeur, you take a moment to examine them more closely. Each statue stands tall and imposing, their poses suggesting readiness for battle, a silent vigil in the now silent fort. The craftsmanship is exquisite, each detail meticulously carved from the folds of the cloaks draping their shoulders to the determined set of their chiseled jaws. Upon closer inspection, you notice a marble emblem on the clasps that secure the cloak to the armor of each statue. The emblem, now tarnished by time, features a roaring lion, its mane flowing back into a flame, a symbol of strength and valor. Surrounding the lion are intertwined vines, symbolizing unity and growth, all encased within a shield. This emblem, you realize, belongs to a Lord Aelius Gallius, a revered warrior and a loyal vassal under the previous Emperor Valerius. Lord Aelius was known for his strategic brilliance. His exploits on the battlefield were legendary, and his leadership was said to inspire those under his command to feats of valor that echoed throughout Auroros. The presence of these statues here speaks volumes of the importance of this fort in times past. It was likely a stronghold of strategic significance, a bastion of power and protection for the realm. Lord Alias' association with this place suggests it once served as a key defensive position, or perhaps even his personal command post during campaigns to quell rebellions or repel invaders. Hmm. You don't happen to remember anyone by the name of Lord Alias Gallius, do you, Tronald? Not from the top of my head, no. Joe, can I remember anyone by that name? Give me a straight intelligence check, Tronald. Hmm, so that's a 14. Tronald, as you rack your brain for any shred of memory regarding Lord Alias Gallius, faint echoes of council meetings past swirl through your mind. You recall his name being mentioned, a footnote perhaps in the larger political or military discussion. However, the context eludes you, shrouded in the very same fog that clouds the memories of your previous life. Sorry, Saxy. I know that there's something there, but I just can't pinpoint what. Meh. Don't worry about it, man. It was more out of interest than anything that was super important to me. All right, then. I want to start exploring this fort until I come across anywhere where I think the goodies could be being kept. As you navigate the fort's labyrinthine corridors and chambers, your steps echo through halls littered with the remnants of history, past rooms that hint at long-forgotten functions, and through doorways that have not felt the touch of beings beside goblins in many years. You press onward. On your journey, you discover dusty armories, abandoned quarters, and more silent, watchful statues, each telling silent tales of a bygone era. Eventually, your explorations lead you to a secluded part of the fort, far from the grand entrance and the gaze of the marble statues. Here, hidden away as if to guard its secrets from unwary eyes, you find it. A massive vault door. Its surface is embellished with intricate carvings that speak of protection and wealth, the metal cool and unyielding beneath your fingertips. In the center, you see a keyhole. It is positioned between an embossment of two open hands. The vault door is stunning. Even after all these years of mistreatment, it does not show its age. So what do you reckon the chances are that this key is for the vault? Given our current streak of luck, I'd say it's either exactly for that door or it's for some completely irrelevant cupboard somewhere in the nowheres of this fort. What do you mean, given our luck? We've had brilliant luck. I'm telling you, 
I don't know how the hell we've survived what we have done in the past couple of days. He's right. 99% of people would have died against what we've been through. Well, put it in then, Rar, and let's see if it is for this. Okay. Joe, I place the key inside of the keyhole and give it a twist. Rar, as you carefully insert the key into the lock, the air fills with the sound of ancient gears grinding and pistons shifting. For a tense moment, nothing happens. Then with a sudden release of pent-up mechanical energy, the vault door swings open with a grace unexpected of such a massive barrier. As the door opens, the sight before you is staggering, enough to make your jaws drop in unison. Before your eyes stretch piles upon piles of riches, gold gleams like a sea under the sun, silver shimmers with the light of the torches outside, and scattered throughout, the cool luster of platinum catches your eye. This is not merely a collection of wealth, it is a hoard that would be the envy of dragons. Amongst the coinage, items of power and beauty rest. Weapons whose edges glint with an almost preternatural sharpness, ornaments crafted with exquisite detail, and jewelry that sparkles with the fire of precious stones. Holy moly, I've never seen so much gold in my life. Joe, do we have any idea how much coin is actually here? You can spend some time to try work it out. You probably wouldn't want to count it coin by coin, but you can make some rough estimations. Jeez, it's that much? Give me a straight intelligence check, Saxy. That's a 17, Joe. All right, Saxy. You step forward with the precision of a scholar, your gaze methodically sweeping over the vast treasure before you. In this moment, your intellect, honed not just by books, but by the myriad experiences of your travels, becomes your greatest tool. You start to calculate, eyes darting from one pile to the next, utilizing formulas that would baffle most, yet come to you as naturally as breathing. As you mutter under your breath, it's as if you're casting a spell, divining the amount of gold and jewels before you through sheer mental prowess. Your companions watch in silence, entranced by your methodical approach, as you mentally dissect the hoard before you, piece by piece, coin by coin. After a series of calculations that feel both endless and instantaneous, you have a rough estimation of how much there is. Before you, you are staring at approximately 2,600 platinum pieces, 33,000 gold pieces, 13,000 silver pieces, and 86,000 copper pieces. Holy fuck. Um, so I'm just gonna throw it out there. Who else is thinking that we just take all this and pretend to the rest of the horde that there was nothing in here? That's pretty funny, Mike, but Gaba and Grizzletooth are our friends, and we owe it to them to help them as much as possible with making the future as bright as possible for this horde. You know, I can't believe that it's the same guy suggesting this that has cheaped out on so much a couple of weeks back. I kind of wish you didn't have that mindset, to be honest. It's selfish of me, but think what we could do with all of this. But you're right. Of course you're right. I'm not suggesting we leave it all. I mean, damn. How much coin do you think these gobos need? I say we take 2,000 of the platinum. That should be easy enough for the five of us to carry. Then we donate the rest to the horde. I mean, we don't even need to lie about it. We just be truthful. We have taken our fair share and left you with the majority. We're fucking rich. Well, we're certainly better off than we were five minutes ago. But rich? I guess that depends in whose eyes. What I'm trying to say is to build a palace, you'd be looking at around 500,000 gold. So yeah, but we're definitely wealthy now. Huh? What would I need a palace for anyway? What? No, dude. I wasn't suggesting we all chip in and start scouting for locations to palace us up. I was just trying to give you a bit of perspective on wealth. You know, what's a fortune to a band of adventurers versus a kingdom? So, yeah. True wealth. The kind that builds empires, commands armies, and influences the fate of nations. That's a different scale entirely. So, yeah, we're wealthy by most measures. But in the grand scheme of things, it's just a drop in the ocean. A very shiny, very welcome drop, mind you. Joe, I know you said there were items laying around here. Yeah, huh? I don't plan on carrying a bunch of bulk out with me, but is there anything that particularly stands out? I'll just cast Detect Magic, see if there is anything cool laying around. Fuck. You've got Detect Magic too? Well, that's just great. I feel like I've absolutely wasted one of my known spells. Don't worry too much about it, Might. Bards get the opportunity to swap all their spells around when they level up. Oh, phew. Because that'd suck. Why is it that big of a deal? Because unlike Tronald over there, I only get access to a certain amount of spells. And Detect Magic is a ritual, so it means that Tronald can cast it even if it's not prepared. So yeah, it's a total waste. Well, if you plan on swapping it out, why don't you cast this one? Might get the most out of it. Yeah, sure, why not? Joe, I cast Detect Magic. Okay then. Might. 
As you weave the threads of your detect magic spell, the cavernous room before you, bathed in the orange glow of torchlight, transforms. Amidst the sea of gold and trinkets, three distinct auras begin to shimmer, calling to you from their scattered hiding places within the horde. With careful steps, you navigate the unstable ground, the coins shifting underfoot like the sands of a forgotten desert, each step a gamble against the metallic tide. To the left, nestled between a pile of goblets and a rusted helmet, the first beacon of magic reveals itself, a ring unassuming in its craftsmanship yet distinguished by the wolf's head emblem that sits atop it. Turning your attention to the right, you discover the second item, a necklace of exquisite beauty, its chain forged from silver that twists and curls like the vines of an enchanted forest, holds a single emerald at its heart. And finally, at the rear of the vault, your journey through the trove brings you to the third and by far the most vibrant of your finds, a lockbox of unparalleled craftsmanship, spanning seven feet in length and a foot in width. Its surface, marred by scratches and gouges, tells a tale of desperation and failed attempts to break into it. Upon its side is a note, etched into the metal in a script that dances before your eyes. Hmm. Interesting. All right, I'm going to take the ring and the necklace over to Tronald. Here you go, buddy. You might want to identify them when you get a chance. Then I want to go back to the lockbox. Can I read what it says? Might, as you peer closer at the intricate etchings on the side of the lockbox, your mind strains against the bounds of your knowledge, searching for any semblance of familiarity within the script. The characters, carved with such precision and clarity, seem to pulse with an inner light, their forms both beautiful and utterly foreign. The craftsmanship is beyond anything you've encountered. Each symbol is a masterpiece. It's fair to say that the artistry is so advanced that that it verges on the alien. Hey guys, come check this out. Just look at this box. It's amazing. I have no idea what it says though. Do any of you? Well, I'm certainly not the one to ask. I think all I know is common. Hmm. I doubt that's right, dude. Do I understand it, Joe? Nope, you don't have a clue. What about me? Tronald, as you lean closer to inspect the script etched into the metal, a peculiar sensation washes over you. Unlike your companions who gaze upon the inscription with bewilderment, you perceive the markings not as an alien script, but in the plain, familiar strokes of common. It's as if the words morph to accommodate your understanding, revealing their message directly to your mind. The engraving reads, Esteemed Lord Gallius, we honor your loyalty with this gift. More will be yours upon completion. The simplicity of the message seems to belie the depth of its implications. Damn, what do you think it could mean? And what do you think is in there? Well, we will find out next time because that is the end of this session. See you later, guys.